take the Bible with me and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going through the book of 2 Corinthians. We're taking uh, our time as we do so. And we're going to cover chapter 2, Lord willing, today. It's just 17 verses. Of all of the 13 letters in our New Testament that uh, were written by the Apostle Paul, I believe that 2 Corinthians, the book we're looking at, is the most personal one. When you read 2 Corinthians, you see how Paul sees things and how he feels about things. In the second half of the first chapter uh, that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, if you remember, Paul is very busy trying to clear up things about uh, a change of plans that he had. Chapter 2 is a fuller explanation of how Paul functioned in ministry. And I want us to see it this way. I want us to look at 2 Corinthians as the way that we ought to function as believers in our life and service for the Lord. Because I think the chapter offers tremendous insight on the dynamic relationship between a pastor and the people. And Paul was a pastor. I mean, he was a church planter. He started a lot of churches there, uh, especially in Asia Minor, but also in uh, Europe. And so he had this relationship with people in these various churches that he started and that he wrote letters to. And so... I think we can learn a lot from it. Let's pause a moment. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll jump in in verse 1. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning that we have a Bible, because we believe, as the Scripture itself says about itself, that the Bible is the Word of God. And so it's not merely the opinions of human beings. And so we're grateful for the supernatural aspect of our Bible because it was holy men of God that the Holy Spirit of God moved upon and carried along to write the scripture that we have in front of us this very day. And I pray that uh, we would uh, take it to heart and see it as a light from God that shines in a very dark period of time, that we would uh, really take heed and allow it to have its work and way in our hearts. Most of all, I pray that when we open the Bible, we would see you, Lord, and that uh, we would understand that this book is really an unveiling and an unfolding of you, your wonderful person, and the privilege that we have of knowing you. So may we come to know you and know you better, as we open this scripture this morning, and we'll just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So he begins in that first verse, we've already read the chapter together, but it really is a carryover from how he ended chapter one. The last uh, verse, of, uh, last couple of verses actually of chapter one, he is basically telling them, you know, you accused me of being. Uh, indecisive and just not really caring about uh, uh, the church because I changed my plans. But really, I changed my plans, we learned uh, in chapter one, that Paul changed his plans as far as visiting the church there at Corinth one time instead of two times, indirectly, instead of directly going there. He changed his plans because God led him differently because he was following the will of God. And he said, I'm going to do what God permits me to do. But also he tells us in the last two verses of chapter one that I changed my plans because if I would have come then, you would be sorry because I would have come uh, in harshness. And so I, God prevented me from coming at that time to spare you from the harshness that uh, otherwise I would have brought to you. Now he further explains it, verse 1, I determined this with myself, 
that I would not come again to you in heaviness. I would not come again to you. That word heaviness means with grief, with uh, pain of mind. I don't want to come to you in sadness. And so the first thing that I want you to see in this chapter, first 11 verses, is that Paul is teaching that despondency is something to be shunned. You know what I mean by shun? To stay away from, to get rid of. Despondency. You know what despondency is? It's, it's uh, an ongoing kind of grief, sorrow, sadness. And what Paul was concerned about is that he and the church would get rid of their sadness. It's gone on long enough is basically what he's saying. And he is concerned about two things regarding this. Number one, he's concerned that this sadness must stop. It's got to stop. That's what he means when he says, I don't want to come to you in heaviness, in sadness. And uh, he says in verse four, out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. He's talking about the previous letter that he had sent them. It was a painful letter. And he wanted that to be passed. He wanted that to be gone. Not that you should be grieved. See that verse four? But that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. And so Paul says, don't live in despondency. Don't live in sadness. Get rid of it. The sadness has to stop is basically what he's saying. He is a church planting pastor and he is distressed because this sadness has actually disrupted the fellowship between him and the church. It has to disrupted the fellowship in that local church in Corinth. You see, there was a problem member in that church. One member at Corinth had caused a problem, and that's what prompted that painful letter that he's talking about in verse 4, that he wrote with many tears and, and, and anguish when he wrote it. But I would say this. There is a time to be straightforward and upfront with people, especially with our brothers and sisters. I like the way the writer of Proverbs puts it. He says, open rebuke is better than secret love. He says, faithfulness is the, are the wounds of a friend. Because when we are open in our rebuke with uh, someone that needs it, we don't do it out of self-righteousness. We don't do it because uh, we want to hurt them. We do it because we want to help them. It's like a parent. When the time comes that you have to discipline your child, when you have to spank that little angel, there comes a time when if you don't, you spoil them. And you don't love them. If you spare them the rod, the Bible says you don't love them. You actually hate them. You've deceived yourself into thinking you're, you love them, but you don't. Whom you love, at times you got to rebuke in love. And that's what Paul is saying. This sadness, this grief has gone on too long. It's disrupted our fellowship as a church. And uh, yes, while we're all saddened by what this problem member did and what we had to do together, the pastor and the congregation, in order to fix it, I want this relationship that I have with you as people, Paul is saying, I want it to be one that we have with confidence and that we can be joyful together with the restoration of this problem person, that this person gets right or has gotten right, and we can rejoice in that. You know, listen to me, behind a ultra-critical attitude, an unkind and bitter attitude, that brings division and a disruption of fellowship, you better be careful because, you know, you can be in cahoots with the devil and doing his work.
in disrupting the fellowship in a local church. In fact, look at what he says in verse 11 of this chapter, if you will. He, he, he's talking about the need to forgive this man because he got right with the Lord and he got right with the church. So you got to forgive him. He said, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we're not ignorant of his devices. The forgiven brother needed to be restored to fellowship. The fellowship was dis disrupted by this person, but he needed to be restored to fellowship lest Satan would put him under the pressure of a self-accusation and morbid introspection. And so uh, as a result, he would not only uh, be cut off from the church, but his relationship with the Lord would continue to be messed up. And so he's saying, we got a deal. This sadness has to stop, okay? It's over. We, the disrupted fellowship has been handled because this fellow has been disciplined. Disrupted fellowship ends when there's a disciplined fellow. <laughs> and that's what verses 5 to 8 is about. Uh, here's what he says in verse 5. If any have caused grief, he hasn't grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all because sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many meaning the church dealt with this guy we're not sure who he was we're not sure what he did it doesn't really matter all we know is that he was a problem member there at uh, at Corinth in that local church and the church dealt with him they personally disciplined him you know there's a uh, there's an aspect we haven't uh, we haven't done it much, but we have in 25 years, a couple of times, we've had to practice what is called church discipline in, on individuals that, uh, that would not heed the, the uh, admonition of the fellowship. And so we had to discipline uh, certain ones at times. But Paul's concern in verses six and seven is this. All right, you've disciplined the guy as a local church. We've, we've practiced church discipline. We've disfellowshipped him. He's gotten right with the Lord. Now let's restore this guy because um, he says, for contrary wise, verse seven, you ought to forgive him and comfort him. Notice why lest perhaps such a one would be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. That is, Paul feared that excessive punishment of this offender would cause him to become overcome by his grief and would do more damage than good. And so he urged the church in verse 8 to reaffirm and to confirm their love toward him. See that in the 8th verse? So he's concerned that this person that messed up and that was dealt with by the church and asked the church to forgive him, that he would be uh, just uh, uh, would be driven to despair. And so he says, look, the time has come to reaffirm our love as a local church to this individual, because I'll tell you something else about Satan's works. The Bible makes it very clear that if we are unforgiving in our hearts, either as individuals or as a church, if we are unforgiving in our hearts, we actually give Satan spiritual geographical territory inside of us. We give him a base of operation, not only personally, but corporately, if we have an unforgiveness that... Uh, we hold on to. And I say that based on, on what Ephesians says. He says, be angry, but sin not, and uh, let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place. That is, that's the word for geography, topos. Neither give place or spiritual geography to the devil in your life or in your church by an unforgiving spirit that grieves the Lord. It, it, uh, it grieves the Holy Spirit when we're unwilling to be kind and forgiving when we're asked to be, okay? And so he's saying, 
this is causing despondency in uh, among the fellow the, the, there's a disrupted fellowship and this fellow has been disciplined and so look the sadness has to stop and what he says in verses two and three basically is gladness must start sadness must stop gladness must start here's how he puts it in verse two for if i make you sorry who's going to make me glad but the same people that i made sorry and I wrote this same unto you, lest when I come, I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. You know what he's saying? You and I impact one another, whether we know it or not, by our attitudes. If we are despondent, guess what? That can become contagious And others can become despondent. And I don't mean that we think that we're encouraged. But I'm telling you, we have a mutual relationship. Pastor and people and just uh, the church in general. We, We have a mutual relationship and we are to share a mutual joyfulness together. The leader and the congregation are together to bring the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is joy. And that joy is a deep joy. It's an inner joy. It's a a supernatural joy. And so it's a lasting joy. So despondency is to be shunned. Stop the sadness, start the gladness is basically what he's saying in in the first 11 verses. But look at verses 12 and 13. Drop down in the chapter with me. Verses 12 and 13 is a second point that, uh, and by the way, I've titled this message, Triumph in Trials. How do you triumph in trial? Well, you got to shun the despondency, but in verses 12 and 13, there is an opportunity to be seized. Look at what he says here. Furthermore, When I came to Troas, which is northern Greece, and Corinth is in southern Greece, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit. I wanted to minister there, but I was troubled over you, is what he's saying in verse 13. I found not Titus, who was in Corinth, to bring back a report to Paul, I couldn't find Titus there in Macedonia, and so I left Macedonia to go find Titus So I, because I was on pins and needles, so to speak, as to what was going on in Corinth. I was so concerned I couldn't even minister properly in Macedonia, Paul says. I couldn't seize that opportunity. He travels north. He finds an open door for the gospel to be ministered at Troas which is, again, part of the reason why his plans all changed. And in verse 12, he tells us where opportunities could lead. A door to be entered and a discovery to be made there in Troas, if he would seize that opportunity, he could be a great blessing through the gospel to the people there. You know, there's opportunities that God opens to us all the time. I'm afraid that many times we're blind to them. We miss them. We're not looking for them. And so we don't seize them. There are opportunities every day that God gives you for gospel outreach, for for ministry, that if you don't look for them, if you're not uh, in tune and walking with the Lord, you never see them. And if you don't see them, you'll never seize them. Paul saw this as an opportunity to be seized. And, and all God asked of us is that we would make ourselves available to be used by him. That are you? Are you available? To, or are you so focused on your own personal agenda that you, you miss the opportunities God God gives you divine appointments. God sets up things for you. And you and maybe uh, some of the things are things that frustrate you or that stress you out or, or make you angry. But you got to see that God's in charge of your schedule. He's in charge of 
everything that you encounter. He knew about it before the day began, right? He knew about it. And so it's a, see it as an opportunity, not as a frustration. When things get uh, perhaps muddled and mixed up in your schedule, in your plan, recognize, hey, this is, this is a divine appointment. God's allowed this. God has, he wants to direct me into an opportunity. He wants to make this an opportunity that he would lead me in. You know, there are opportunities, amazing ones, here in the church, in your home, in your family relationships, in your office where you work, the hospital, school, in your neighborhood, wherever. There are amazing doors of opportunity that are to be seized by us. Let's not miss them because it's sad when opportunities are lost. An opportunity at Troas was lost. You know why? Because there was a problem in the church at Corinth and it distracted Paul from the door of opportunity that he could have seized in the city of Troas. But he lost that because of the, the situation in Corinth. The problem is that these distractions take time and energy from the church and from believers in general to have ministry with people, to have ministry with, other, with others because of these problems. There's a, uh, so my point is this, part of the triumph and trial is look at uh, the change and, and look at what you would call a problem as an opportunity to seize for ministry. Oh, Lord. Here's a third thing. Go down to verses 14 and 16. This is really, to me, verses 14 to 16 is, is really the heart of this passage and the heart of the book of, uh, of 2 Corinthians. Where he says this. He's, uh, you know, he's got to be feeling bad because he had a great door of opportunity in Troas, but he wasn't able to take full advantage of it because of the problem situation in Corinth. But rather than becoming despondent, look at what he says in verse 14 as he begins. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor or the aroma of, the, of his knowledge, of Christ's knowledge, by us in every place, be it Troas or Corinth or wherever. So here's a third thing. There is a victory to be shared. There is a victory to be shared that he's talking about in these verses. Now, what happened? Well, uh, Paul says in verse 13 that when he was at Troas, he was distracted by the situation, the problem situation in Corinth, and he had sent Titus, his, his co-worker, to Corinth to bring back a report to him so that his mind could be set at ease, and he didn't find Titus in, in uh, Troas, so he left, he left, and he went from Macedonia, he went to try to hook up with Titus and get a report from him. That's how he lost an opportunity there in Troas. However, his meeting Titus, which took place in uh, in uh, probably the, the city of uh, Philippi, when he met him, his heart was thrilled with praise for the victory that God was giving. He realized that uh, the problem there was being resolved. And so he thanks God for the victory. What looked like defeat was actually Christ working victory. And this is the thing that uh, these verses really bring out to us, especially uh, the 15 and 16. What you have in these verses is an illustration that I think if you understand this illustration, you'll get a good uh, overview of what 
the Christian life is about and what ministry as a believer is about. We all have ministry. Whether we take advantage of it or not, that's, that's another question. But every believer has ministry available to them. Well, how does that get done? How is that to be performed? Well, the illustration verses 14 and 15 is amazing to me as I came to study it and uh, understand it. Basically, what he's saying is this. What from the outside appears like the ministry isn't accomplishing anything. It looks like total defeat. Looks like nothing's happening is really not as it seems. Actually, there is continual victory that prompts Paul's heart to thank God, as he does in verse 14. He thanks God for God's grace that enables him, that empowers him, that causes him to triumph in the worst of circumstances. That phrase there in verse 14, causeth us to triumph, is one word in the Greek language that the New Testament was written in. And what's interesting is the word itself is not what I thought it was. I always looked at this passage as a word that is describing a Roman triumphal procession. And what I mean by that is when the Romans went to war, when they had a victory, the army would come back and the, the Roman emperor would lead a, we would call it a ticker tape parade here in New York City, right? The emperor would be at the head of, of a parade and uh, he would lead this victory procession and uh, behind him would be the defeated king and, uh, and all of his army. And then uh, they would uh, give praise to the gods of Rome. But this particular word, translated by that phrase, causes us to triumph in Christ. Causes us to triumph is not a word that refers to a Roman triumph procession, but a Greek triumph procession called the Estruscan. It's an Estruscan word, and their triumphal procession was different from the Romans. In the Etruscan triumphal procession, the one that led the procession was not the conquering king, but the captive king. The captive king, the defeated king, he was the first one in line, and as he walked through the crowd, he would be spit on, he would be beaten up, and at the end of the procession, that, uh, that conquered captive king would be sacrificed to the Etruscan gods who were credited with the victory. And the victorious king was the one that brought up the rear. And so what we have pictured in this phrase, God which always causes us to triumph in Christ, what we have pictured is Christ not as the conquering king, but as the conquered king. Christ is pictured in this verse, not as the victor, but rather as the one that is conquered. He is pictured as the king that will be sacrificed. And it really shows us what God's plan of redemption is all about. God's redemptive plan for the ages is that, that, that Christ himself leads is really a procession that leads to the altar of self-sacrifice. In fact, the implication as he goes on in that, uh, that, that 14th verse, he says, it makes the savor or the aroma of the knowledge of Christ, the gospel of Christ, you might say, to be uh, diffused everywhere we go. Verse 15, 
we are unto God a sweet aroma of Christ in them that are saved. But in them that are perished, the opposite. We are an aroma of death. And uh, to the other of life, but to the ones that are perishing, we spread an aroma of death. Here's the implication of what he's saying to us. Christian lives are to be lived totally given to God as an act of self-sacrifice. And when our lives are totally given to God like that, there is a sweet Christ-like fragrance that rises up to God. Listen to what is said about Christ. This is Ephesians chapter 5. I just want to read it to you. And verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Listen. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us. There's the self-sacrifice at Calvary at the cross. And hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice, notice this, to God for a sweet-smelling aroma, a sweet-smelling savor. And it connects with this passage that we're looking at in verses 14 and 15 here. And what he's saying is that when our lives are totally given to God, a, a sweet Christ-like aroma rises up to God from our lives like it did from Christ's life when he gave himself and this triumphal procession because it is made out of a sacrifice of ourselves. The fragrance of the gospel is emitted worldwide, is uh, diffused all over the place. And to some that smell, that aroma, uh, to those that are that are saved, uh, that trust Christ, it becomes an aroma of life. But on the other hand, those that reject Christ, then our self-sacrifice of the gospel of Christ becomes an aroma of death to them. Aroma that leads to death because they rejected Christ. And so that's why he says, in the second uh, sentence in verse 16, and who is sufficient for these things? What, what's he what's he mean by that statement? He's saying, who is adequate for that kind of a task in spreading of the gospel if in actuality, you know what spreading the gospel amounts to? It's a death march. It's a death to self. It's a victorious death march. That's why he says, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. It's a victorious death march that we're involved in, is what he's saying. And if that's the method, then who is adequate to take on that task? Jesus said the same thing. Where do you think Paul got this? from the same Spirit of God that Jesus spoke. Remember when Jesus said to his disciples, when Peter tried to hold them back from sacrificing himself, and, and Jesus said to Peter, you speak like Satan, get behind me. And then Jesus said this, if any person will follow me, here's what you got to do. You got to deny yourself. You got to say no to yourself. What are your plans? What's your agenda? What's your purpose in life? You got to say no to self if you're going to follow me. And you got to take up your cross. That is, you not only have to deny yourself, you not only have to say no to yourself, you have to be willing to die to yourself. Now, that, not, that may not include a physical death, but it does include spiritually, saying no and dying to yourself. That's what he's talking about here. He got it from Jesus. That's what it means to follow him. And I will make you fishers of men. 
It means you die to yourself so that men can live. So that aroma of life can be diffused wherever you go. Look, who is sufficient for that? Who is adequate for that kind of a life? It requires supernatural enablement. It requires God's power. And folks, the whole theme of the book of 2 Corinthians is the strength of weakness. That is, that we have no strength. We are totally weak. But it is his enabling power that gives us strength in replacement of our weakness. It is a life out of death. It is a death to self that releases a resurrection Christ life through us. And that's why he ends the chapter in verse 17 this way. For we are not as many which corrupt the word, but as of sincerity. We're not trying to manipulate the Bible to make it say something that makes you feel good about yourself or that gets you off the hook easily. We're not preaching a, tre- a, a cheap gospel so that we can uh, deceptively grab people and, uh, and bring them. No, we're telling it as it is. Yes, salvation is free. But as someone said, once you're saved, the annual dues are all you have, your whole self. And here's what he says in that 17th verse. We speak sincerely of God in the sight of God. We uh, speak we in Christ. There's a testimony here that we ought to study. And it's simply this, if I could round it all out. Success with the Lord is because the Holy Spirit is working through you. Successful ministry is not because you have some huge personality that is charismatic and draws people like a magnet to yourself, but rather success in ministry is because the Holy Spirit is working through you to accomplish his will. It is what Paul said, Christ in you. And when Christ is in you, you're dead to yourself. You've taken up the cross. You're dead to yourself. Nevertheless, you're alive because Christ is in you. You have his life, his resurrection life. You have the life of Christ in you, and it is Christ in you who is working through you, listen to me, as you. He doesn't change your personality. You're the same personality, but he takes your personality and he works his will through you to empower your gospel outreach. So how do you triumph in trial? Well, there's a a despondency that you have to shun. You have to get rid of it. Get rid of the sadness, all right? Replace it. Let that stop. Let the gladness start. There's opportunities that you have to be aware of to seize. And you need to see even the twists and turns and what the song said, thorny ways. You need to see them as opportunities that God has arranged for you. They're not flukes. We're not fluking. This is the way God works. And there is a victory as we've seen in verses 14 to 16, that that all of us share in. But it requires self-sacrifice and letting Christ work in and through us. And that's the key to success and triumph and trial. Reminds me of uh, missionary John and Mary Williams. This was back in the uh, 1800s. They, uh, Mary Williams, she surrendered to missions when she was a young lady and she married John and they sailed for the South Pacific in 1817. They lived in primitive huts on the Cook Islands. They had a growing family. Um, 
She and her family moved with their husband, John, to Rarotonga, to the islands there that he had recently discovered. And she and her family would often travel to neighboring islands as well with the gospel. And after 10 years of real hardship in missionary activity, John wanted to sail without his wife and family 1,800 miles away and be gone for six months because he heard about the Samoan Islands. And of course, Mary wasn't too happy about that. In fact, she opposed her husband when she found out his plan. And uh, she knew that he would be going to one of the most savage peoples that, they, that uh, they were aware of in that South Pacific. And so she said, why would you do that? That's a death wish. A few months later, Mary got sick. And at 38, she lay dying. And uh, John, her husband, was praying fervently for her healing. And God answered her his prayer. And as she lay recovering, she asked the Lord why she almost died. And the thought that he brought to her mind, you're standing in your husband's way of serving me. So she called her husband. She said, John, God's shown me that I cannot stand in your way any longer. I want you to go. And so he did. He left, and he shared uh, with the Samoans. He made that his top priority. In 1830, he planted the first seeds of the gospel there that blossomed into a very fruitful ministry. And it reminds me of the stanza of a, a hymn that we sometimes sing. Are you ready for it? Listen to the words. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever.